God bless you. God increase you more and more in Jesus' name. Okay, um, so we can start uh, basically. Oh, thank you, Father, because your word is light. And thank you because the entrance of your word is light and understanding to the symbol, simple. Um, we bless your name in Jesus' name. Um, oh, Coin. Lord, thank you of the real, because of the reality that we're in Mount Zion and we are surrounded by an innumerable company of angels. And we're here at the church of the firstborn. Thank you because the speaking of the blood is here. We've come to the Father. We've come to the blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. Thank you, Father, that we've come for perfection. We have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched. But we've come to you. We've come for fellowship. Take all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, so we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, our advantage. Um, so how do I start? Thank you, Jesus. So in the beginning, when Jesus, God had an idea, he had a vision for humanity. And what he used or who he used to bring about, about this idea was a personality. One thing, what, what one of the key person that was he or was a full come into the creation of the old universe was a personality called the Holy Spirit. The Bible introduces us to him moving upon the waters. And because of his movement, because of his work, the ideas, the imaginations, the visions that God, the desires, the dreams of God were able to come back to life. And from that day, even till now, God has not changed. It's the same God from before even till now and that's how it's always going to be the holy spirit is the one that brings the ideas that are in the heart of god and brings it into fruition praise god so as we as we share i i know we are going to be blessed today i know that we are going to be impacted i know that the holy spirit himself will talk to us and he himself will teach us um i'm going to start with a popular scripture the bible says um just a second, please. Scripture is looking. In the book of Acts. Acts chapter No, no, Acts, sorry. The book of Isaiah, yes. Isaiah. As, uh, I think it's chapter 4. Okay, Isaiah chapter 2. And I'm just going to say something. It's, it's um, verse 2. It says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So Isaiah is introducing us to a future day of the house of, 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 of what is going to be happening in Isaiah. And he says that the house of God is going to be exalted above all the other houses or all the other mountains, and everyone will come and lead, learn from it. And saying the law of God will proceed from that house. And when people hear this word of God, it will, it will change their mindsets. 
He says that nations will no longer learn at war anymore. And he says that many people will beat their swords, weapons or instruments to gain territory, weapons or instruments to cause death and chaos. They will turn into plowshares, which is an instrument for farming, you know, and they are spears into pruning hooks, you know, which is also an instrument for farming, you know. And it says that there will be no war, but it will propagate peace. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this today is the book of James introduces us to a particular concept. It says that the reason why there are wars and fights amongst us is because of our desires and that these desires, we want to spend it on our own lust. We're saying that when we properly hear the word of God, one of the first things it does is that it changes our souls. So as the word of God is going forth, as we are sharing the word of God, what it does is that it has the ability first to quench the desire for war in our hearts, you know, and help us or transform us to people that can share life with others. Um, and I believe that as we share the word of God with each other, this will be manifest here today in the mighty name of Jesus. So I'm going to be talking about the Holy Spirit today. How many of us are excited about that? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be mentioning how is our advantage, or I'm going to be emphasizing how the Holy Spirit is our advantage. Um, so when you look at the Bible, you see a lot of people that are seemingly advantaged in the Bible. For example, you are introduced to Abraham. And it's in the land of famine where there's no water everywhere. But this guy just seems to always find wells, despite he's in a barren land. You are introduced to someone called Isaac. That's where everybody is saying, I planted seeds. I planted my maize. There was no harvest. Isaac will sow in that land. And the same year, he will reap a thousand fold. It's like things are just working for him easily. Where people sweat, toil, and need to, 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 to stretch for. Isaac just, he just falls upon Isaac, Isaac's lap. You are introduced to characters like um, Joseph, for example, that favor anywhere he is, he just prosper. Even if you take him to a prison, whatever you shall put on his, in his hand, he's most prosper. The thing will blow, you know. Um, the, the Bible talks about Laban. He says, by experience, I've learned about Jacob, that when he came to my business, my business was different, you know. So you see people in the Bible that it seems that their cases with regards to their contemporaries is very, very different. And the experiences of others, unfortunately, or fortunately for them, is not their experiences. You, know, you are introduced to a man, for example, called David. Um, David is just a man in the wilderness. He's just a young boy in the wilderness. And the Bible says from the day oil was poured upon him, some extraordinary ability just fell upon him. Extraordinary favor just came up, fell upon him. The Bible says men started trooping to him. He had wisdom on what to do. He behaved himself differently from others. Jonathan just looked at him and loved him, you know, and it just looked like his life was different, you know. So we are, we are, if, you, if you're a student of the Bible, you are familiar with stories of people that have been advantaged in the Bible. I think most of us as Christians, we confess this advantage over ourselves. We say as our brothers or our forefathers experience this advantage, we also want to experience that, uh, that same advantage. So we're just going to be touching a bit on some of the um, advantages or taking a deeper insight to this ad advantage that um, <clears throat> scripture shows us. And I'm going to start in the Bible read from the book of Acts. Chapter 10, verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Now see what scripture says. It says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. 
for God was with him. Now, we are introduced to Jesus and we see that he's empowered to do miraculous things and he's empowered to live a different kind of life, a special kind of life, an advantage kind of life. And when Paul is, pre- or, or when um, Peter is preaching this, he says that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit, um, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good. And he, he went about healing everyone that was oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And the reason why he was able to do this, the Bible is able to introduce us to a concept called an anointing. An anointing, an anointing, an anointing. And I'm just going to start there from an anointing. The first thing I would like to start is what is an anointing or what does it mean to be anointed? You know, um, we call Jesus, Jesus Christ. And I know most of us on this call here know that Christ is not the son name of Jesus. Christ has a meaning. Christ is not a name. Christ is a title. Um, in Greek, they call it Christos. And the Jews call it, um, me, it can be translated in English as Messiah. And the meaning of Christ, it, mean, it simply means the anointed one. The anointed one. One that has been anointed, you know. Um, so Christ has a title and it's called the anointed one. And the anointing is the first time we can see a mention of it. I'm sure some of us that grew up in Pentecostal circles, you, you, grew, up, you grew up around a lot of anointing oil. I remember that day in some of the churches I grew up in, I would anoint. By the time I'm going out, my head is shining. There's oil in the middle of my head. Sometimes there's oil on my toes. There's oil on my tongue. And even till today, we still experience that in, in, in the Pentecostal churches. Some of you, you are anointed by your parents. And it was like, it was too much. Like, ah, mommy, I'm going to school. I have finished going a bottle up on my head, you know. So we are familiar with this concept of we being anointed, you know. But what is the anointing? And what is the importance of the anointing? Um, like I said, we are not losing focus. The topic is still the belief, the Holy Spirit, the believer's advantage of, for victory, you know. Uh, but I'm starting with an anointing. So if you look at scriptures, especially the book of Exodus, you find out something peculiar. Exodus chapter 30. Um, let's see if we can read it together. Exodus chapter 30. Um, I'll start from verse 22. He says, moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid mare, half as much sweet smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet smelling cane, 500 shekels of kajia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and an in of oil. And you shall make from this a holy anointing oil, an ointment compounded according to the art of a perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. So I'm sure if you are reading this um, scripture, you realize that there's a bit of a difference between the anointing oil that was used of old and the anointing oil we use now. The anointing oil that was used of old, I would relate it more to like perfume oils. It wasn't just a normal olive oil. Olive oil was part of the ingredient, but it was not only the ingredient. It had so much fragrance. It was like a perfume. It, it, it was a perfume, and it was even mixed by perfumers, by, by, um, accord, according to Exodus chapter 30. You know. So one of the characteristics of the anointing in those days that I want to emphasize on is that it was a perfume and it had big fragrance. It was a perfume and it had fragrance. It was a perfume and it had fragrance, you know. And when you look at it, even in the New Testament, Paul is trying to explain something to us about this anointing. In the book of 2 Corinthians, it Paul tells us that we are the fragrance of Christ. He says, thanks be to God who always leads us. Um, let, me, let, me, let me read that verbatim. 2 Corinthians 2. I'm going to start from verse 14. Uh, 
or if someone is there, they can paste it on the chat. Um, Second Corinthians 2. Yeah. Second Corinthians 2. I'm going to start from, from verse 14. He says, Now, thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh us manifest the symbol of his knowledge by us in by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. I really love NKJV, but my NKJV version is not really open. But it tells us that we are the fragrance of Christ. Now, I'm just going to start with this. The anointing. Jesus is called Jesus Christ, which is meaning, which means the anointed one. And the book of Acts chapter 10 introduces us to what this means. It says that Jesus was anointed, but it doesn't say that Jesus was anointed with mere oil. It says he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power. Now, the oil that was used in those days had fragrance. Now, when you are anointed with the Holy Ghost, according to 2 Corinthians, you also carry a fragrance. Now, according to that book, it says that that fragrance, wherever you go, it, it can cause light to be propagated. So just as someone, a lady or a man, um, um, sprays very good perfume on themselves and they walk into the room, and everywhere is smelling nice, everywhere is smelling like, everybody's like, wow, who walked in? Who is that? Who is that? You know, it's, 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 how I put this? It's an example of what it means to be anointed. Just as everybody loves the fragrance of perfume, or most people should love the fragrance of perfume, it's an example of what it means to be anointed. So when Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit, there was a fragrance he was carrying. This is why when he entered, um, when he went into some places, there were people that were attracted to him. He could attract crowd. And there were also people that were repelled and irritated by him. For example, people that were demon-possessed. The Bible says anytime Jesus will pass by, it will, it will cause a reaction. People will say, why have you come here to persecute us be, 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 before our time? People will hate him. Why? Because of the fragrance he carried. Because of the anointing he carried. You know. So, First of all, like I'm, like I'm trying to explain, the anointing, first of all, according to what it was before, carried a fragrance. And that fragrance caused the reaction. And one of the things I want you to know right now, just as they saw Paul Jesus, Jesus Christ, and they called you a Christian, what it means is that you are, a, you are anointed. I want someone to type on the chat room, type that I am anointed. I am anointed. I am anointed. I want you to tap on top. Type, I am anointed. And I want this to be a consciousness we walk in. You carry a fragrance. You carry a fragrance. And demons know it. Angels know it. And even God knows it. The Bible says that we carry the fragrance that is a sweet savor in Christ unto God. It is a fragrance that attracts the angelic. It is a fragrance that commands favor. This is the fragrance that causes Joseph to be favored by who needs to favor him. This is the fragrance that causes Jonathan to see David and to love him. This is the fragrance that causes Jacob that whatever he lays his hand on is as if creation is working in his behalf. This is the fragrance that Jesus carried that when he was in the boat and he tells Peter by his word, cast your your, your fish, your net to the other side, it attracts possibilities. It attracts favor. It, it attracts a different atmosphere. It attracts a different system. You are anointed. That's the first thing I want you to know. And you carry a fragrance. You need to understand that. And that fragrance gives you an advantage. Why am I emphasizing? That advantage will attract favor from the people that favor should be attracted from. But also, in hindsight, or something you need to understand by this anointing is that that anointing also causes persecution. That is why Jesus also says, blessed are you when men persecute you. When you begin to walk in this level of anointing, 
That is why Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 2, he says that you are a fragrance. To some, you are a fragrance of life unto them. Well, to others, I think um, from verse 14, yes, I've got in NKJV. He says, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, in victory in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So you are anointed and you carry a fragrance of his knowledge. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. So when God smells you, he smells Christ. The fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, we are the aroma of life leading to life. So like I said, it's a double-edged sword. Your anointing causes favor to be attracted to you. But sometimes the anointing also causes some oppositions. The reason why I want you to understand this reality is sometimes as Christians, we emphasize that favor, 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 favor. And it is true and it is scriptural. But there is another reality of the anointing. The anointing also sometimes attracts persecution. I won't even say sometimes, I'll say all the time. So look at everyone that was anointed in scriptures. Look at Joseph. People that he didn't do anything to, wanted to do harm to him. Look at Jesus. People that he tried to save, tried to do harm to him. Look at David. An example. People that a, a king that he served faithfully was just agitated and irritated by him. Why? Because he was anointed. So I want you to Understand the fact that you have been anointed and you have been perfumed, so you carry a fragrance. And that fragrance differentiates you from others, other people. Another thing I want to talk about, about the anointing is this. Oil, like I said, in those days was not just normal Goya oil or the Goya bottle. It was a perfume oil. Secondly, Oil, if you look at the application of oil, we know that we anoint ourselves with oil. If, you have, if, you, if you've been in a matano and your skin is very dry and cracky and not beautiful, it's very ashy, let me say it like that. I don't know the correct lingua to use for that. And you put oil upon it. What does it cause? It causes relief. It causes your skin to be sooth soothed. So oil has the capacity to rejuvenate everywhere it touches. It has the capacity to bring to life what was dry and lifeless. If you have food that looks like, I know maybe some of us are, on, um, are using air fryers these days, or we are trying to watch our co cholesterol level, but everybody knows that food with oil is the sweetest. And you want to spice your food up, you anoint that food with oil, you know. So oil can bring life into situations. Oil can bring smoothness into situations. And another thing that was very important about oil in those days, or the, the oil in those days, it was that it was a fuel for fire. It was a fuel for fire. Please pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm still on the Holy Spirit. It was a fuel for fire. If you look at the parable of the wise, the wise and the foolish virgins, they, there are some that had oil in their lamps and there were some that didn't have oil in that lamp. And oil was a fuel for, for fire. So the meaning of an anointing is this. When you are anointed, you have the capacity to shine. The Bible says you are the light of the world. When you look at Christ as anointed, he has a fragrance. When you look at Christ as anointed, there was an oil upon him that gave him the capacity to shine. Now, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good, healing all those that was oppressed by the devil. The Bible also says this, he went about doing good. When you see he went about doing good, he went about shining his light. The Bible also says in the book of Matthew, it says, shine your, he said, um, he said, let your, you are the light of the world, a city set upon a hill. He said, show and uh, let your good works be seen by men. So men may see your good works and give glory to God. So by good works, your good works is your shining. But you see, you can't do good by yourself. There is an anointing for the good work. Just like oil is needed for fire. The, the reason why Jesus 
was able to shine the way he was shining was because there was an oil upon him. There was a fuel source upon him that gave him the capacity to shine, to do good works. Maybe we just spend um, a minute or two there. Um, I think it's in the book of Matthew chapter 5. Uh, and I want you to compare this thing that is being used to the book of Acts. Um, is it Matthew 5? You are a city set upon a hill. Or is it Matthew 6? Maybe it's Matthew 6. Um, oh, you are the light of the world. The city is the Matthew. I think I just want to spend a minute on that scripture. I think it's very, very important. Oh, I think it's Matthew 5. Oh. Yes, Matthew 5. From verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. He says, let your light shine so before men that they may see your good works. So light and good works is the same. And glorify your father in heaven. So anytime you see something called good works, what you are seeing according to Jesus is called light. And if you look at the lingua used in Acts 10, it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. And he went about doing good works. Now, but for him to do those good works, he needed an anointing. He needed an anointing. Without oil in those days, fire cannot burn. And the reason why I'm saying this is that I don't want us to be foolish virgins looking to shine, but we do not have oil in our basket. Someone say after me, I am anointed. I am anointed. I am anointed. Type in the group uh, in the in the chat box. I am anointed. I am anointed. I am anointed. I am anointed. You know. So, like I was saying, Christ is the title, and the title simply means the anointed one. It means the anointed one. And we are when we call yourself a Christian, what you are saying is that you are an anointed one. What Second Corinthians is saying is we're not going to, I don't want to go through too, too many scriptures. I just want us to lay foundation of a few. What Second Corinthians is saying is, is that you are anointed with the free grounds of Christ. So, like I said, oil in those days was a perfume, and oil was a fuel to fire. And what I was saying is this: that Jesus is called the anointed one. Why is he called the anointed one? God is the Father, is the invisible one, the vis invisible one. God is the Father. And Jesus is the Son. And Jesus came to reveal who the Father was to us. The Bible tells us in the book of John that the Son has come so that we may have an understanding of who God is. Jesus came who to reveal who God was. God is to us. The book of Hebrews explains this very, 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 very well. Spot on. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. He says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, as in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed here of all things, through whom he has made the world. This is the emphasis I'm placing on it. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. So who is Jesus? Is the brightness of the glory of God, the Father. Is the express image of the Father. That is why when Thomas asked Jesus, he says, I'm sure as the Father, Jesus says, don't you understand? Once you see me, I am the exact image of the Father. Through Jesus, we see God that man has not seen before. And through Jesus, God sees man as man should be. But moving forward, when he has... So, he is the brightness of the, his glory and the express image of his person. 
So God is the Father and Jesus is the image. But for Jesus to correctly image the Father, he needed what we call the Holy Spirit. He needed an anointing. Jesus could not properly, did not have the capacity, would not have the capacity to represent God except he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. All the good works that you see Jesus was doing on earth were good works that were empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is why when the, the, the rich young ruler asks Jesus, he says, good master. And Jesus tells him something. He says, why do you call me good? He says, no one is good apart from God. What Jesus is trying to say is God is good. And anytime you see good, it has come from God. But what gives the person the capacity, just like oil is fell to the fire, to do the good is an anointing. And that anointing is called the Holy Spirit. Please, I cannot overemphasize this, this, this the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I can't overemphasize the importance of the Holy Spirit. Because of a lot of times, the enemy tries to get us into a place where we are defeated, where we where we try to do works of self-righteousness. Because it's possible to fast on your own. It is possible to pray on your own. The Pharisees were doing it. It is possible to give on your own. But it is impossible to do good works on your own. What God, not what men call good works, but what men, what God calls good works, it is impossible to do it on your own. You need something called the anointing. And this anointing is your advantage. It's your leverage. It's your leverage. It's your it's 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 your it's your it's it's what differentiates you or sets you apart from others. And in those days, that anointing was only limited to kings and, and priests. And it gave them the capacity to do good works in court. What do I mean? It gave them the capacity. To image a God that the Israelites have not seen. So when you see an anointed person, an anointed person is like a portal between heaven and earth. So when people were seeing Moses, they were seeing God. When people were seeing David in a way, they were seeing God. Anytime David won a battle for them, anytime David delivered them from their adversaries, anytime David expanded the kingdom the kingdom of the, of the saints, what they were seeing is God. But how was David able to image the strength of God, the dunamis of God, the wisdom of God, the ability of God, the power of God? It was true and anointing. How was Samson able to, 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 to show the Israelites the, the power of God, the, the, the spirit of might? It was true and anointing. And the Lord wants you to know now that this anointing that was only limited to priests and kings and sometimes prophets has now been shared abroad to everyone called a Christian. When you are called a Christian, it means that you are anointed. And this is your advantage. So I've said this, um, and, and I hope that blessed us. But I'm going to be saying, how do you take advantage of the Holy Spirit? Paul says something so, 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 so good. He says that I am what I am by the grace of God. But he says the grace of God did not come to me in vain. So now you have been given an advantage position. How do you ensure that you take advantage of your advantage? Because, because so for example, you need a car and I give you a million. I give you, and the car is worth a million. And I give you a hundred million. I've given you the capacity and the advantage for you to buy the car that is worth a million. And maybe someone else adds exactly what that one million, exactly that one million. If you choose not to spend that money, you will not have the car, although you have the advantage to have the car. And the person that used all his one million to buy the car, even though he gave all that he had, you know, it might look like, oh, it's more advantage than you. But no, you are given a position of advantage. But it's up to you to use this position of advantage. So what are the advantages that we have in the Holy Spirit? Um, I can't cover all, but I'll be, covering, I'll be covering some advantages that we have in the Holy Spirit. 
The first scripture I'll be reading from is the book of Hebrews. And I'll, I'll be showing you how Jesus had adva was advantaged over his peers. I'm going to be reading Hebrews 1 verse 9 in the NIV translation. It says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions. So it's explaining how Jesus was set above his companions. He says, by anointing you with the oil of joy. Now, the oil of joy is not a different anointing. It's not that one time God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and, and with power. Then in a separate occasion, he anointed him with the oil of joy. No, the Holy Spirit is the oil of joy. The advantage, one of the advantages he says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions. How did God do it? By anointing you with the oil of joy. So Jesus was advantaged by anointing him with the oil of joy. And not like, like we said, one of, the, one of the people we saw anointed in the Bible was David. And you see, when you're anointed, joy comes with it. You're anointed with joy. One of the things the Holy Spirit brings is joy. One of the so we see that <clears throat> Jesus was anointed and was differentiated by the by the by by the oil of joy. Some translation calls it the oil of gladness. See what Psalm fifty one says. Now Psalm fifty one, we know this is when David slept with Bathsheba, that's Uriah's wife, and he's trying to repent, and he's he's saying. Things that he had enjoyed from the priest, things that he enjoyed by the anointing of God. He says, Do not cast me from your presence, O Lord, or take your Holy Spirit from me. How did David receive the Holy Spirit? How did David really receive the Holy Spirit? If you've been following, David received the Holy Spirit when he was anointed. The anointing of Samuel. So when people pour oil upon you, it's not the oil in itself has no power. Olive oil that we import, to be very honest with you, is cooking oil in, in some localities. You can use that oil to cook. So the power itself is not in the oil. The power is in what the oil represents. And there are ways sometimes where, as human beings, where we idolize the truth instead of, instead of respecting what it represents, you know. So how did it re receive this, this um, Holy, the Holy Spirit? It was when it was anointed by someone. He says, restore to me the joy of salvation. So when David was anointed, that anointing came with a joy. It came with joy. Joy. Oh, I want someone to write, you are anointed. I'm, I've been anointed with the joy. You've been anointed with the joy. That is why Jesus will tell you something. He says, be of good cheer, for you have overcome the world. You see, when you see a Christian that is in the face of adversity, but he is rejoicing, his joy is not down. He, he says the joy of the Lord is his strength. When you see that man fortified, that man is walking in the spirit. That man is doing that not from his flesh, he's doing that by an anointing. When you see David has the ability in a place where men wept till there was no strength again and they wanted to stone themselves. And David has the ability to get himself out of depression. Even though he was in the same situation as them, someone has lost his wife, his family, his, his own business. Yet, he feels temporary sadness. But he says, bring me the effort. And he comes up and he encourages himself in the Lord. What you see is a man that has been anointed. And you see, as a Christian, you have an advantage. You have an advantage. You do not grieve like others grieve. You do not have to go through pain like others go through. If there's someone here, you are going through a heartbreak. I'm telling you, you do not have to go through heartbreak like the people of the world. If you're someone here, you've lost a loved one. I mourn with you for the Bible says mourn with those that mourn. I am not insensitive to your pain. But what I'm saying is that there is an anointing that can soothe the soul of the brokenhearted. I'm saying 
there is an anointing that can take you out of depression. I'm saying that there is an anointing that despite and in spite of your bank account, you are bubbly, you are not down, you are not defeated, that you do not look like what you are going through. There is an anointing of joy that exalts you from your brethren. And this is one of the advantages, he leverages as a believer that you must take advantage of the joy of your salvation. Oh, for the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. In the Holy Ghost, there is an anointing for joy. So don't you, this is an advantage that you have. It is an advantage of an anointing. Another advantage you have but being anointed is found in the book of Romans. It's found in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1 verse 3. He says, um, verse 2, let me start from 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised before and through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God. And let me read that in NKJV. He says, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. One of the power things that the Holy Spirit does is that it comes with a declaration. It's a powerful declaration. He said the Holy Spirit declared Jesus to be the Son of God and he declared him to be a Son of God with power. I just imagine a powerful speaker that can be heard in Hades on the earth and in the heavens. And it was the Holy Spirit that declared, it was the amplifying voice that declared that this is the Son of God and he declared it with power by resurrecting him from the dead. So one of the advantages you have in the Holy Spirit is resurrection. It is resurrection. What am I saying? Resurrection is, 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 is a life that has conquered death. It's like, you see, when Adam sinned, the most powerful force on earth after Adam sinned was death. And for the unbeliever, the most powerful, he says, death, he says the power of sin is death. The sting or the efficacy of sin, the weapon of sin is death. And death is king to the natural man. Death is king to the natural man. You see, when you see scarcity, that's an operation of death. When you see sickness, that's an operation of death. That is why when you cut an apple today, by tomorrow it decays. When you see rot, decay. That is why if you do not try to work on things, they will decay automatically. There is a law of sin and death in the environment. So death is the most powerful thing in this natural world, in this falling world. you know. But Jesus started to int introduce something by an anointing. He started introducing something by an anointing. He started introducing something by an anointing. Emmanuel, what are you saying? The Bible says, Adam, the ground is cursed because of you. So, man began embodying death. That is why the strongest nations you see in the world are nations with the capacity to inflict the most death. You say this nation is strong because of its nuclear weapons, because of its capacity to injure, damage, to cause pain. Because of that, they are powerful. You know, So, death reigns, and those that partner with death gain... Um, ascendancy in the kingdom of darkness, you know. But God started to introduce a new kind of life, a life stronger than death. And we see this in bits and pieces. We see this in the life of Abraham, that Abraham, although his body is dead, life comes out of it. So there's a life that comes upon Abraham that is stronger than death that was working in Abraham. Abraham's body was as good as death. But there was an anointing that came upon Abraham that what was not natural, what ended for a 99 year old man was a beginning from him. So he, at 99 years old, he was able to birth a new thing. 
it also fell upon Sarah that at 90 years old, she was able to birth a new thing. There was an anointing upon her. You see this anointing upon the life of Aaron. The Bible says that when there was contention about the priesthood of Aaron, should Aaron be priest or not? It says, um, Moses says, bring all your staff into the presence of God. And let's, let's see. Let's see what will happen. And everybody brought dead staff. Staff is the dead wood. Wood that has been disconnected from the ground for ages, and they put it in front of the presence of God. And at the presence of God, it was rod buds, it bears almond tree fruits. Almond takes up at least five years. If you, if you guys think this is scam, these guys were in the wilderness. In the wilderness, things don't go. So nobody will have quickly go and pluck almond from his backyard. Maybe if they were in the promised land, you say. Mm, maybe someone that went to block almond from the backyard and took it to assemble. They were in the wilderness. But the Bible says Aaron's staff grew, it budded, it became something different, introducing us to an anointing that is stronger than death. I'm going to say something very, very weird here. There was an anointing that came upon Moses that at 120 years old, he, his eyes were not dim. His, his feet were not weak. At 120 years old, he was walking upon mountains. Do you know what it means for a 120 year old man to climb a mountain and stay there for 40 days? Have you ever processed that? Does that seem natural to you? What kind of life have they taught? See, they Aaron. And Moses could not die a natural death. The Bible says when it was time for Moses to die, God had to call him up the mountain. Moses had to drop his life. Death could not touch him again. How about Aaron? Aaron was wearing the priestly garment when it was time for him to die. Aaron did not die with his... He had to remove the priestly garment before God should touch him. These are types and shadows of an eternal life that God wants to introduce to us. And so we see in, in Jesus that he's promising eternal life. Why is he promising eternal life? For so there is an anointing there's an anointing, there's an anointing that is stronger than death. It is called resurrection life. And this anointing raised Jesus from the dead. And by this anointing, Jesus says that we that believe in him, everyone that is called a Christian, we are part of a people that have, taste, that have an anointing that is stronger than death. So I'm trying here, I have resurrection anointing. I have resurrection anointing. This goes down to your finances. With this food down, you cannot be barren. You cannot be unfruitful. Whatever you lay your hands on will prosper. For death reigned by Adam because the ground is cursed because of Adam. So there is scarcity because of a man called Adam. But there is abundance because of a man called Jesus. For by one man, sin and scarcity entered into the world. But by one man, life has come called Jesus Christ. And that life, you have an advantage of resurrection power. You have an advantage of resurrection power. You have an advantage of resurrection power. Resurrection power. Resurrection power. Resurrection power. This is what was working in the life of Isaac. That when he sowed into the land, everything was yielding for him. He walked in abundance. For in God, there is life. There is no scarcity. And there is an anointing. The spirit is the custodian of the life of God. The spirit is the custodian for the life of God. But when God wanted to bring life, he breathed his spirit into man. The spirit is a carrier of life. I want someone to type in the chat box, nothing can die in my hands. Type it, nothing can die around me. You see, when I say you are anointed with a fragrance, you are anointed with a fragrance of life. See, there's an anointing upon you and it affects the things that happen around you. Jesus in the wilderness showed us there is no scarcity. He, he multiplies bread. He's not stranded. Where does that bread come from? See, oil, the thing about anointing is that oil can be transmitted. They call it minshak. It, it's spreading anointing, just like butter. Oil spreads. Oil spread. So the anointing upon your life is transferable. You can lay your hands on your bank account and it will, it has ears, I tell you. How would a gigabyte bread in the wilderness multiply? Can a scientist ever explain that to you? How a gigabyte bread will multiply? 
you, your bank account, you can lay your hands upon it. You can lay your hands upon your womb. You can lay your hands upon your head. Everything that is dead can come back to life by the anointing. By the anointing. This is your advantage. Another advantage, we'll soon be rounding up. Another advantage is that the Holy Spirit has come to declare sonship. It's still tied, um, 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 it's still tied to 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 Romans one three Romans eight fifteen. He says we've not received the spirit of bondage to fear, but we received the spirit of adoption, where we cry that Abba is our Father. This is one of the pre this is one of the greatest advantage. This is like this is the greatest advantage you can have, that you are a son of God. But the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it says angels sin and men sin. And since God did not come from the, so he does not send aid to the fallen angels, but he sends aid to the seed of Abraham. His son is a son. His son is a son. You have an advantage of sonship. What is the advantage of sonship? Oh, there was time, but I'll, I'll just be, I'll just be rounding up now. Maybe I'll just menu on this. Maybe I'll just end on this. You have an advantage of, what's the advantage of sonship? I say this, I've said this over and over and again, but I'll still say it again. Imagine if for, for parents here, you know, I, I used to tell a story. I remember one day I used to think I was very smart then. Uh, and maybe I was very smart then, but I overestimated my abilities. So I remember one day my mom took me to a school um, um, outside where I was living. Then it was like three hours drive, you know, to write an entrance exam. And you know, they gave me the 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 exam papers, and within twenty minutes, I, I finished the whole exam. Man, before you know it, everybody in the school was present. They say, ah, ah, "This your boy. He's very smart. Oh, he's very good. Oh, he's very good. Oh." If you guys have watched the the clip of um, Josh, too funny. I can read fast, <laughs> and just scripts to the book. Or uh, the, the, the clip of Josh too funny. What did he, what did he say again? Uh, no, they, they asked someone a, a question. He says, What what special ability you have do you have? He says, I calculate figures very fast. So they asked him what is one thousand times five hundred and forty-eight. He says two thousand eight hundred and seventy-six. Said that is wrong. So but it was fast. Shit. <laughs> so I finished with speed. Unfortunately for me, my my answers were very incorrect. And it wasn't like I didn't know those things. I wasn't just patient. The Lord teach us patience in Jesus' name. I wasn't just patient, and I just finished with speed. And so this, they, they changed their confession that instead of a smart boy, they said, ah, maybe he would do in primary, primary five star. My mom remembers what they told her, Udusha, but they said, I'm not going to GS1, that they'll give me primary five star or primary, primary four star or something like that. Cha, you know. And I remember the, the car ride back from this state that we traveled to because it was in and it back to my house. It was quiet. Ah, my mom was disappointed. She was. But do you know what? She didn't throw me out of the house. I still chop that night. <laughs> Last night, I still ate food that night. <laughs> I still ate that night. <laughs> I still wear clothes the next day. <laughs> she didn't say, Emmanuel, you failed an exam. Ah, you can't live in this house again. You have failed me. And some of us think that that's how God is. <laughs> that once you fail, he'll just kick you out. <laughs> the anointing for sonship is an anointing for forgiveness of sins. Is an anointing for forgiveness of sins. Oh, we are closing. Just type in the chat, but says my sins have been forgiven. Is an anointing for forgiveness of sins. The anointing for sonship is an anointing for the forgiveness of sins. Oh, when God is talking about David in Psalm 89, he says, if he sins, I will chastise him with the rod. But he says, I will not take my mercy away from him. Like I took it away from Saul. There was a covenant of sonship that David entered. It is an anointing for the forgiveness of sins. That where Saul's career ended, David's career took off. It is an anointing for the forgiveness of sins. I just feel like 
I need to, I need to, I need, I need to expatiate on this. He says, I will not take away my mercy from David like I took it away from Saul. Why? Because David has been anointed. David has been anointed. David has been anointed. David has been anointed. And no matter how, if you can't say your child was so bad, so they will not eat in your house, or you will not pay their school fees next summer, they will call you a bad parent. They will call you, maybe you didn't give birth to the child, maybe it's your stepchild as a responsibility. What will they offer you? They will, some, of, some parents even go too much, too far in trying to make sure their children succeed. They know the child didn't pass that exam. That's not what God do. They go, they enter medical center. I know my child didn't pass, but medical center. Success center. This child will succeed. So, parents, but God doesn't do that. Some parents hire tutors, <laughs> and that's what God does. He hires tutors, in jelly tutors. You say you do not understand. You say you are weak. He doesn't give up on you. He strengthened his son. He sent angels to minister to him. He sent angels to supply strength to him in the place of prayer. He sent angels to give Daniel on Sunday is an anointing for the forgiveness of sins, and it is your advantage as a son. It is an, your advantage as a son. It is your advantage as a son. It is your advantage as a son. Um, I think I'll just read Psalm 89, then we're done. Um, we're done. Psalm 89. Mm, okay. See what Psalm, Psalm, see, see, see Psalm 89. Verse, I'll read from verse 20. Please, I want you guys to menu on this scripture. I want you guys to confess the scripture over yourself. It says, I have found my servant David. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom, with whom my hand shall be established. My arm shall strengthen him. He says, the enemy shall not outwit him, nor shall the sons of wickedness out afflict him. He says, I will beat down his foes before his face, and I will plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and mercy shall be with him. This is a covenant of sonship. By anointing. David was anointed into this covenant. You also are anointed into this covenant. So walk in this reality. He says, but my, my faithfulness and mercy, he says, and in my name, his horn shall be exalted. Also, I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. I will strengthen him to gain territories. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn, the arrives of the kings of the earth. This psalm is actually about Christ, but <laughs> my mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. He said also, I will make endure forever, and his thrones uh, will, uh, 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 and, his, and his thrones at the day of heaven. If his faults are came my law and do not walk in my judgment, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But see what it says, nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lip. Once have I sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. This is the promise of God to you. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithfulness, faithful witness of the of sky. You have an anointing for forgiveness. You were anointed. I mean, that anointing is the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, God. Let's begin to bless the name of God for we are anointed. Let's begin to bless his holy name for he has anointed us. We are a chosen generation. We've been called for to show his excellence. We've been anointed for excellence. All we require for life God has given us. We know who we are. I want someone to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. We have we've come to the end. But I want us to pray in the Holy Ghost as a community. We are a chosen generation. We've been called forth to show righteousness. And what we require for life, he has given us. We know who we are. The anointing, the anointing he has given you. 
the anointing for ministry, the anointing for your calling, the anointing for your workplace, the wisdom needed, it is in the anointing, the joy needed, it is the anointing, the life needed, it is in the anointing. You've been anointed for you are a you are Christ, you are a Christian, you are an anointed one. Elipra hakurapaha sindege lindeke lifra hakurapaha. We know who God says we are, where He says we are. What he says we are, we know who we are. We are walking in power. We are walking in miracles. We live a life of faith. Oh, for we know who we are. I want us to pray. I want us to pray. I want us to pray. If you're not in a noisy place, we've come to the end of the program. So don't worry. Let's just unmute our mics and let us pray together. What the enemy tries to do, he tries to make us forget our advantage. He tries to make us forget our advantage. He tries to rob us off of our advantage. It makes you feel like you're an orphan. It makes you feel like you do not have hope. It makes you feel like you are cornered. And I want us to pray. 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 Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Begin to declare that you are anointed, that you are a Christian, that you are Christ, that you've been anointed with favor, that you have been anointed with joy, so depression is not permitted. You have been anointed with joy. I know what happened to you. People are, are legitimizing, legitimizing the depression, but it is not permitted. Jesus. The anointing has the power to take it away. You have been anointed, so you must be favored. You can't walk without favor because you are anointed. And you are not being without help. You cannot be helpless. In the name of Jesus, you are anointed. You are running good. In the name of Jesus, you are running good. In the mighty name of Jesus, in my own my blood, you are running good. In the mighty name of Jesus, that may be the work I do good. In my environment, I do good. Every situation. I find myself I do good. I've been anointed with the Holy Spirit of power. In the mighty name of Jesus, Makaya Masataya, I go around in good. Everywhere I find myself I do good. In the name of Jesus, Makaya Masataya, I go around in good. Of influence and the spreading of the gospel, you have been anointed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.